So what we're going to do in this chapter is we're going to focus on uh, the random variables n, the x's, and then the s, the total aggregate loss. And we're going to refer to them uh, as we've been doing so far. So n is the so-called claim count random variable. Its distribution is referred to as the claim count or the frequency distribution. The xj's, xj, xj's are the individual or single loss random variables. We will call them uh, the losses or the severities. And then our s is the aggregate loss or the total loss random variable. Yeah. So make sure you uh, are well aware of those terms because they will often come back in uh, exercises, on the exam, etc. So if I ask something about the aggregate loss, or if, if I refer to the individual loss, then you should know uh, what the difference is between these two concepts. So what we're going to do is we're going to skip this, this section. Yeah? So it's discussed in the book, but you can just skip that. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at the distribution of S. Um, so the distribution of the aggregate loss that comes with a set of n observed uh, claims, x1 up to xn. And the approach that um, we would develop huh, goes uh, via three steps. And that is, well, first of all, you would need to build a model for the claim count or for the frequency random variable, given the data that you have available. You would develop a model for the xj's based on those data. And then if you have access to these two fitted models, you would need to carry out the calculations that would lead you then to the distribution of this, of this s, right? So there are three steps in general. And in this chapter in particular, we're going to focus on the third step. Huh? So if you have a distribution for n, and if you have a distribution for the xj's, what are then the strategies that you have at your disposal to come to the distribution of S? And you can imagine that for certain cases, you can do that analytically. For other cases, you will rely on approximations like the central limit, limit theorem or other types of approximations. Um, and uh, yet another strategy that we're going to explain in this chapter is we're going to see our Panier recursion the Panier recursion that we discussed so far for compound random variables, which use uh, a count distribution as the primary and another count distribution as the secondary distribution. So we're going to revisit that Panier recursion scheme in this chapter to make sure that we can go for the secondary distribution, we can use a severity distribution. Yeah? And then the Panier recursion will offer, will offer us a recursive scheme to get grip on the distribution of this uh, total loss on the distribution of this S random variable. Yeah? So the first two steps in my three-step approach that I list over here, they deal with estimation. That's what we're going to cover as soon as this chapter is done. So that will be the subject of, of the chapters that will follow in our book. OK, so if I look at the random sum, um, the compound sum S, I'm going to work with uh, the sum of x1 and so on up to x capital N. And one of the questions that I can ask is, yeah, what about the distribution of this S, right? So if we start uh, thinking about this, then we quickly engage once again in the concept of a convolution. Yeah. Um, so let me just see what would be the... Yeah, let me just uh, do that once again on the iPad. So if you look at the compound uh, sum, the S, this is the guy we want to treat. And first of all, we can think about the CDF of, of S, right? So we think about what is the CDF of S evaluated in X? What is the probability that S is less than or equal to X? And we know you can uh, use here the law of total probability. So what we're going to do is we're going to work with a conditional probability. We're going to condition on the value that n takes. And we're going to multiply with the probability that n takes the value n. And we're going to sum over all the values that n can take. And n is a count random variable, so that goes from 0 to plus infinity, let's say. Now, if you know how many terms there will be in uh, the sum, uh, what you can write then is this 
this probability here. We can write it as the n-fold convolution of the random variable x evaluated in the point x or in the value x. And the reason is because we uh, assume that our xj's, that they follow independent and identical uh, an identical distribution indicated here with the distribution of the random variable x. Yeah? So this is something we've seen uh, before. Also note that we introduce typically a very uh, brief notation for this uh, probability function of, of the count random variable, and that's typically my, my pn, right? Now, um, if I look at this, at this convolution, I can think about it in a recursive way as well. And this is something you're going to do in the tutorial, which, which often leads to, to very long um, calculations. But you're going to explore that a little bit in the tutorial, just to get a good feeling on how complicated the calculations with these, with these convolutions um, often or, or quickly become. Right. So let's look at the n-fold convolution. And what we can say then is, if you look at this uh, n-fold convolution, if I write it like like this, right? So what I, if I want to build up a recursive scheme, what I recognize here is then, of course, the n minus one fold convolution. And that's a connection that I would like to to explore here a little bit. So in general, I could say that if you um, switch to the n minus one fold convolution, so if you condition on the value that this xn is going to take, yeah, then you can write this probability in the following way. It's the probability that x1 up to xn minus one take a value smaller than or equal to x minus y multiplied with the density of x evaluated in y. And you let the y, uh, the value that this x uh, can take or this xn can take, you let that go from, in principle, uh, for a very general construction, this uh, x can take a value between minus infinity and plus infinity. Now, that would be the very general construction. Of course, for the kind of applications that we have in mind, we will assume that the losses take positive values. So our integral, our boundaries will uh, be uh, will be between 0 and x, right? Because otherwise, if we would allow the, um, the loss for x to go above x, yeah, then here we would create a negative value. And that's something we would not take into account if we're thinking about positive losses. Yeah, but this would be the general construction. And the reason why I first of all denote it like this is because then you can easily see what the uh, corresponding density function would become. So what I recognize here is the n minus one fold convolution evaluated in x minus y multiplied with the density of x evaluated in y. And in principle, once again, this is evaluated from minus infinity uh, to plus infinity. Yeah, so here I'm using x as the common distribution of my x1 up to xn. And it's a continuous distribution, so I'm writing down my, con my convolution in the continuous setting. If you look at this construction, this is for the CDF, right? So this is my CDF. This is my expression recursively for the n-fold convolution of x evaluated in x. If I switch to the probability density function, then I can see if I take the derivative with respect to x, then I'll retrieve an expression for the uh, PDF of my unfold convolution evaluated in x by doing something similar. I'll just uh, switch the order of taking the derivative and the integral. I need to take the derivative here of the CDF, so that becomes the um, so that becomes the corresponding uh, PDF and the other expressions they don't depend on x so I get something like like this yeah so this is the point that I want to make this is a very general recursive expression 
for the n-fold convolution if I'm working with independent random variables with a continuous distribution. If I limit to positive, so if I limit this whole construction to uh, positive uh, losses, then I'll have to adjust my boundaries and I'll have to switch to take the integral from zero to x. So that would be the impact of switching to the assumption of positive uh, losses. Yeah, this is for the continuous setting. Um, let me just take one more moment to do the same for the um, for the discrete setting. I've, I've been treating these convolutions um, earlier in, or before in the uh, lectures, but then I've just focused on two random variables, right? So here I'm doing something similar. No? I start with uh, n random variables, but I split it up into the n minus one fold convolution and then just one extra random variable, right? And then I can do the same kind of reasoning as what I did when discussing the convolution of two random variables. Let's see what that becomes if you look at um, discrete random variables. All right. So if I would do this with uh, discrete random variables, right? So let's say we look at the unfold convolution. Then we would look at this sum. We're going to treat them again as the n minus one fold convolution, and then just one extra random variable. We're going to assume that all the x's are from a common distribution of the random variable x, and they are now uh, taking count distributions. Right. So we work with discrete random variables. So what, we, what we're going to do is instead of working with an integral, we need to work with a sum. And we're going to say what you have here is the n minus 1 fold convolution evaluated in x minus y multiplied with, uh, yeah, I'm going to denote it with fx evaluated in y, but you could see this as the, the probability function of x evaluated in y. It's the probability that x takes the value y. And then this y can take values from 0 to, to x. Yeah? So you recognize a similar construction, but instead of working with an integral, you're, of course, working here with uh, a sum. And then if you look at the corresponding, so this is for the CDF. If you work with the probability function, yeah? so not the probability density function, but the probability function, then you're going to focus on what is the probability that this n-fold convolution is taking a value exactly equal to n, right? That's what we want to know here. Um, and which we, which we could denote, um, and that's the notation used in the book, with the small f. And with the small f here refers not to a probability density function, but to a probability function and which we can see then as, once again, this sum with y going from 0 to x with the probability that the n minus 1 fold convolution takes the value of x minus y multiplied with the probability that the random variable x takes the value of y. So here again, the f, f notation, um, this fx, notation here should be understood as the probability function. Because we work with a discrete uh, random variable. So returning to the, to the sheet, so what we discussed is uh, sheet number uh, 15, uh, number 16 as well, where we cover the uh, n-fold convolution in the continuous setting with the recursive expression. Um, I also need, of course, if I work with a, with a recursion, I need a boundary uh, condition. So I need to specify what this convolution becomes in, in step zero, so to say. And that's what you see over here by means of uh, the convention that we make for the, um, for the CDF of the zero-fold convolution. Yeah? And here you then see um, that and this is something I, I didn't discuss, but 
remember what my starting point was. My starting point was the uh, CDF of S, where I was using then the unfold convolution of the distribution of, uh, of X. So here you can also say that this is the CDF, but because we have a PDF that corresponds with this unfold convolution, we can also write down the expression for the PDF of S, right? And that's what you will find on one of the uh, on one of the sheets as well. So that's the step that I'm taking here, where I refer to the probability density function of S, where S is my compound sum, and where I'm going to rely on the PDF that comes with the unfold convolution uh, of the distribution of X in case I'm working with continuous, uh, continuously uh, distributed random variable uh, X. Now, if you wonder, if you look at this um, PDF of S, this is of course specified in the, for the case where X is strictly positive. Because if I would evaluate the probability density of function of S in the point x is equal to zero, right? And if I'm working with continuously distributed random variables x, which take strictly positive values, then the only situation in which this compound sum s can take the value of zero would be the case where the number of terms in the sum is equal to zero. So the probability that s is equal to zero then reduces in this continuous setting reduces to the probability that n is equal to zero and the number of terms in the sum is equal to zero. If you would do something similar for the discrete random variables, and that's then on the next page, and so we discussed the convolutions for the discrete case, and if you would put that all together, well here of course you can see that my uh, expression here in the sum starts from n equal to zero, because if you work with discrete random variables, in your total, uh, in your compound sum construction, then this compound sum can take the value of zero if the number of terms in the sum is zero, but it can also take the value of zero in case all of the x's, which are discrete random variables in the sum, in case they take the value of zero. Yeah? So this is slightly different uh, if you compare the, the discrete case versus the continuous case. case. Yeah?